Yat e Ifram Anderson Yenishe, Hashkashinashle, Hon Thana Bashachin, Kilachini Dashache, Ashi Dashanele. Hello, my name is Ephraim Anderson. My mother is Mud Clan. My father's mother is Many Houses. My mother's father's family is Red House, and my father's father's family is Salt. I'm a weaver from the Navajo Nation in Shiprock, New Mexico. And thank you for joining me in the Artists in Their Residence series with Bosque Redondo and the National Park Service. I am a weaver whose family has a unique history. I've only heard my grandmother and both sides talk about weaving, but only my mother's mother wove. And she was a Two Great Hills weaver, Mary Hunt from the Hunt family. That's where all the Kislechitneys and mud clans are that make me and then my father's family they had stories about how the blankets they used to trade brought them everything that they had in their in their world and how important it was and actually i inherited my father's mother's tools and that's what i've used for the basis of all my weavings <laughs> KWYK would often play all day while I was growing up with my paternal grandparents, Charlotte and Chi Anderson Sr. Both told stories of how the last chief blanket woven in the 1870s brought 40 or so Palomino horses from North Dakota, offspring that the family prized and valued as much as the weaving all the way up until the boarding school and oil field were made those things less important. The capped wells dotted the landscape before I grew up. Oftentimes the road between each oil well was also a trail we would take the sheep down. But there was no sound of weaving and the tools laid silent in the storage cyst out in the valley near the sheep camp. To hear the sounds that I make now I would have to go to my maternal grandmother's home in Mike Springs just south of the mesas of two gray hills. Only here did my maternal grandmother help me with my weaving assignments, mandatory for all school-age Navajo children around first grade. But the next time I touched a loom would be almost 30 years after she last helped me. Coming back home many years later, I resolved to reestablish weaving within my family. I gathered up the old tools, the looms, and wove. But with both grandmothers unable to help me now, the need for a living weaving teacher was my next goal. I gathered the old tools, the looms, and wove, but none of it was satisfactory. I needed a living weaving teacher. This led me to Master Weaver Roy Cady and a four-year apprenticeship. Through him and his fellow students, we experienced all those stories my grandmothers told me. Those years were memorable because they were like reliving my childhood for all the little things that I took for granted. And by the end of the apprenticeship, I was determined to make my weavings tell the stories of my life and the survival of countless generations of Navajo weavers through the ages. My weavings are frank and sometimes dark and sometimes grotesque. They speak of trauma and loss, but ultimately the acceptance of life's circumstances. Conflict and contradiction through critical thought and debate makes harmony and peace. I don't weave regional styles or any Pendleton or Western prop Navajo textiles. My weavings speak for themselves. My story, your story, the story of humanity's existential anxieties and dilemmas. And it is the triumph of happiness one finds in success that is woven between the warps and weft. I Exist is going to be a textile that combines 19th century Navajo and Pueblo weaving techniques together with modern materials to tell a story in colors. One that honors every ancestors that ever took up the spindle and batten. This weaving will be a witness to the contemporary generations learning the tragic story of the Navajo Long Walk, the colonialism, the forced acculturation, but eventually their survival and their triumph 
that even after 150 years, there are young Navajo youths choosing to care for their grandparents, learning how to run a sheep camp, take care of the land and water, and make a reasonable living while doing it. With this textile, I envision a black warp twill woven with diamond twill tapestry. It starts with black and white and finds every color under the rainbow woven in a zigzag pattern from both ends. This textile will show itself along with any historic Navajo weaving and they will find themselves in a familiar place telling the familiar stories of survival and existence. I, We Exist is going to be completely hand spun with Navajo materials done in a semi-modern way considering that I shear and spend a lot of time looking for the best wool for the Navajo reservation. This is my particular way of cleaning wool. I like to shake out each fleece and skirt it myself and pick the best parts of the wool, separating it, making sure to shake out all the dirt and vegetable matter that I can. I have to keep my surfaces clean. I use gypsum to help break the charge that keeps dirt and other matter in wool. And I do a lot of shaking and separating. Make sure to keep everything clean. A lot of times the more work I do at this stage, the better the wool gets later. Then I grade the wool from hairy to fine. And I take some time to separate. And eventually, I will heat up water. And I use a alcohol bleaching detergent. Some people will still use yucca. Some people will use any detergent that they prefer. This is what I use. Uh, I keep my temperatures all around 120 degrees so the water never gets hotter than what my hands can stand. And I wash in little bundles, making sure to recycle my water uh, for each fleece that I process. So I do a pre-soak in room temperature water and then I do a 30 minute soak in 115, 120 degree water making sure to rinse and soak between the two around the same temperature before allowing it to cool the room temperature. So this is me just uh, double checking the temperature, making sure that it doesn't go over. Any drastic change in temperature can ruin the wool by felting it. And everyone has their own particular way of, of processing wool. This is just my way. Sometimes I will separate the fiber at this stage to pre to open the fibers up, making sure to be careful. Now if the fibers are not too sticky, that is a good sign. This fleece was matted and it was a two year shear. So there was some already pre-felted matted wool uh, that I just took extra time to, to open up. And this is uh, hydrogen peroxide. Sometimes there's a lot of yolk and yellowness to the wool. Just a very dilute solution will help brighten up the wool. And I only usually use this for the back when more hairy parts of the wool. All the wool is spun dry and then allowed to cool and dry in the sun. So this is the second batch of the wool from what I previously skirted. So you can already see the difference in luster 
uh, color and brightness. Honestly, I, I love clean wool. It just reminds me so much of clouds. <clears throat> now, everyone always has their own hypothesis and theories for how Navajos spun uh, before cards. Naturally, you can spin directly from the fleece. You just take these little bunches and you pull them into pre rovings and you can get very nice yarn just by spinning this kind of fleece. And of course, this is Navajo churro. It has Kemp inner wool and outer hairs. But if you find good fleeces out there, you'll find that there are fleeces that have really long wool and very fine hair and that makes the best type of wool to spin. So this is my demonstration of how you can spin without metal instruments, cards, or combs. And anyone who has seen some of the old grandmothers and uncles that weave and spin, the spinning refines the luster and technique the more steps you do so most really fine navajo yarn is spun six times where it's essentially pulled and a slight twist is introduced a really good accomplished spinner can do all the steps in one spin So I've based all my tool sizes and my spinning tools on historic Dineta um, archaeological finds. Uh, there is a cache of tools. Uh, there was a lot of storage in that area. So there's a good, uh, there's a good idea of how much and size, weight, and length for most of the tools. So this is what I developed for this. And of course, I've adapted modern techniques. You can comb Navajo churro and get pre roving such as this. Uh, so I can skip the six spin and spin directly to the size that I want. This spindle was created at a tool making workshop sponsored by Mark H. Deschitney, where we turn juniper branches into spindle whorls. And as with all things, every family, every clan has their particular technique for spinning. This is just my way of doing this. So I'm not exactly saying that everyone should do it my way. But if they were to learn it, it's just another piece of knowledge that may be useful to them in their journey of weaving. This is an example of short draw technique where the spin is introduced in small little links as you're pulling, as opposed to the long draw technique, which I will show in a little bit. I exist, we exist requires about 900 yards of warp and an estimated 3000 yards of weft. And I can, in a pinch, spin about 500 yards a day uh, in this fine type of uh, yarn. So I've never really uh, timed myself uh, to other spinners, but for every week of weaving, it usually takes a day of spinning, which to me works out really nice. This is an example of the two stick warping method uh, with the warping frame. So I've already prepared my warp. It was dark brown Navajo churro and I've turned it black and I'm going in a figure eight pattern. And the warp setup is going to be like a 19th century twill fabric. 
so we will just let the, the time lapse take over for this is a very tedious process and will take uh, a, a good warper could do it in a day but it took me um, two attempts and three days to warp this up Join me next week as I talk more about previous projects that I've worked with the Bosque Redondo Memorial Museum and to give an update on I Exist, We Exist, the textile that I'm working for this Artist in Their Residence series. So stay tuned to the Bosque Redondo Facebook page and NPS Artist in Residence series. And thank you for giving my time today.